Hey friends and neighbors, this here video is about converting my old 93 GT Core Cora mountain bike into an e-bike just because it would be so much more fun and it is. Uh, what I used for my conversion was a Voila Mart hub. Uh, this thing was pretty highly rated on the bike forums, considered a good product for the money. I uh, used a 1000 watt 48 volt hub kit. Cost me about 190 bucks. So anyhow, I'm calling this video Building It and I hope to do a second one that will be called Riding It where I'll cover uh, tips and tricks and trade-offs and give you some more information about how you can customize the controller for your riding style. Alright, so let's get started. Alright, alright, alright. Here we go. So a conversion requires two purchases, a hub kit and a battery. Kits sometimes say they contain everything you need. That is a lie. They are wrong. You need a battery. Okay, the battery has to match the voltage of the hub motor that you buy. You should get one with as many amp hours as you can afford to maximize your range. My battery is a 48 volt, 13 amp hour battery, which gives me a range of anywhere from uh, 20 to 50 miles, depending on how hard I pedal and how steep the hills are. The Voila hub kit, <laughs> can't help but say it that way, is a well packaged kit that consists of the following items a hub motor on a 26 inch spoked rim, a tire and inner tube, and a seven sprocket cassette. Uh, which is all exactly what my old GT has. It's the most common size for hub motors, it looks like. Then there's the controller and controller bag and the controller interface, the pedal assist magnet ring and sensor, the two brake controllers, and the hand grip and hand grip throttle controller. The first thing you want to do is thread the seven sprocket cassette onto the hub and you don't have to worry about a tool here because just pedaling the bike will tighten that. Then you want to put on the inner tube and tire and then you're ready to swap out the wheel. The axle dropouts on my GT were what slotted I guess similar to this and the new hubs axle was flattened as you can see here so it slipped in perfectly and because the axle is flattened it can't rotate in the frame even under full power. If you don't have a slotted dropout, you're screwed. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, what you'll have to do is get one of these things, which is a torque bar adapter, I think it's called. That will keep your axle from spinning. Uh, you won't get loose nuts. And hopefully your wheel won't fall off when you're in front of a semi at 35 miles an hour, which would be a very bad thing. When you put the wheel on, you want to make sure you've got enough washers between the sprocket cassette and the frame so that you give your smallest ring plenty of room so it doesn't rub up against the frame. The other thing you'll want to do is make sure that the wires coming out of the hub are going up instead of down, assuming that you want to run the wires up along the frame towards the seat. Next I decided to tackle the pedal assist since that seemed to be giving people a lot of problems. You'll need to pull the pedal crank off so you need some type of pulling tool or perhaps a very large sledgehammer and a crowbar maybe? Maybe a blowtorch. Yeah. Luckily I had a crank removal tool from years of working on my own bicycles. My crankshaft has a tapered square center, so it's a bitch to get it off without the right tool. Once the crank was off, lo and behold, the PAS sensor fit perfectly over the bearing race. All I had to do was remove the lock ring, put the sensor on, and tighten the lock ring back up. 
Then the magnet ring slides over the crankshaft and the pedal crank goes back on. Easy peasy. Or so I thought. Okay, so in the real series of events, I put the whole bike together and started riding it. And that's when this PAS problem showed up. As you can see, well, first of all, the pedal was loose. So I had to tighten the pedal even tighter, which pushed that magnet ring into the race and the lock nut for the bearing race. And since the rotation of the pedal on this side of the shaft was counterclockwise, it unscrewed the bearing race and the lock nut and till eventually it just locked up the pedal and it wouldn't turn anymore. So I took it apart and I decided what it needed was a washer. For some reason, that was the stupidest thing ever. It just made the problem worse. So what I needed to do, I realized, was to keep the pedal away from the magnet ring. The only way to do that was to shim the shaft. So I found some flashing and I cut that out and made a shim and tightened it up real good. And as soon as I started pedaling, of course, I've got 150, 160 pounds of pressure on that. It just turned that flashing into tinfoil and the pedal came loose. I tried it a second time, same thing happened. Pedal kept getting loose because the flashing was compressing. So I decided that just wasn't going to work. So my only other option was to put it somewhere in the back. I uh, wasn't sure how that would happen. Or I could change it over to the other side where the triple ring sprockets are. So to test the feasibility of that, I took the other pedal off and lo and behold, this side of the shaft had at least, well, it was over a quarter of an inch, uh, more than enough for that magnet ring to fit in there without being pressed against the race. Even if it was pressed against the race, on this side it would tighten the race, but uh, it would still create some friction there I didn't want. So upon inspecting the sprockets, it became obvious that the smallest sprocket would have to be removed permanently. I uh, didn't see that as a problem at all because from riding the bicycle, I knew that it was so fast and so powerful, I'd never have to gear that far down. So the next problem was that the magnet ring was too big to fit inside the housing stanchions of the small ring. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but that's where the small ring is bolted to the rest of the sprocket assembly. Not only that, the ring bolts were in a five-point pattern, and the magnet ring had eight magnets. But I guess they anticipated something like that, because as you can see, they left holes for, the, for relocating the magnets. I rotated the magnet ring until I found a position that would require the least amount of magnet swapping and removal. I marked everything and then took it to the grindstone. Once I had it all notched out and reconfigured, it fit within the sprocket ring assembly quite nicely. Now for the sensor, there's no lock ring on the sprocket side, so the sensor had to be installed between the race and the bike frame which caused the bearing to be loose, right? Actually, not a big deal. Simply compensate for it by retightening the bearing on the other side. The bag that holds the controller has three straps, so it can be mounted in a bunch of different places, probably on different bikes. I thought the most likely spot was here because the top strap there will hold it, will keep it from sliding down, and it will also keep it from flopping back and forth. So let's take another look at this. These straps, of course, I was talking about are Velcro. And I've run the cable from the pedal assist, the PAS system, up through inside of those. Let's take a look at this. Unzip this thing. 
Here's the controller. It sits down in there nicely. Uh, come on out, buddy. There it is. Got a few extra things. Uh, I have no idea what these are for. But, I guess I don't need them. Actually, I do know what these blue wires are for. These are to reduce the speed. You plug it in, and then you can't get more than 750 watts out of the battery. So it's to limit your speed for European countries, I believe. So, back in the saddle again. Back where a friend is a friend. There we go. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, now this mount, hang on. Okay, so this is the battery mount. Um, and it's made to use these two screws uh, from the original water bottle holder. I guess it was that way. Okay, so now on some bikes, it, you know, maybe the water bottle's up here because this is actually upside down. Uh, this should be the bottom. This should be at the top. Uh, but the battery wouldn't fit if it was sit if it was mounted correctly. So I had to reverse it. Uh, the battery slides on this way. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, which left this top part. There's quite a bit of gap here, and any jiggling like this would could break this thing eventually. So I went ahead and uh, put a screw in here to and tap the frame and just put a screw to secure it so it's real tight. The uh, these mounts down here. Can you see them? They have their rubber and their curve to fit the frame. So that's pretty nice. Okay, so here's the battery. Uh, it comes with a battery charger. And this one has a place to plug in the USB so you can charge your cell phone uh, with it. This locks the battery in place, it doesn't turn it off or on, it just locks it into place. Uh, so let's put that battery on, and I'll show you what I mean by upside down. So, let me zoom back out a little bit. So this would be the, normally be the top. So this is going in like this. I have to scoot the, Controller bag over slightly to get it in. Then it just I do there. Then it just scoots up like that, and then you just lock it into place right here. Boom! That's in there tight. Okay, so moving up to the amazing wiring job I've seen you admiring. It's my Mad Max design. Actually, what I I just had three leads coming out from the brake, the uh, controller interface, and the PAS selector. Those three were going, and I just wanted to wire it all up and make sure everything worked and. So I can always shorten these. I have a crimper, so I can put ends on these and shorten it. And I got some ideas for making this much nicer, but it's a real hot rod look at this point. Um, the battery, because I put the controller back here, the battery did not read, the, the battery leads didn't reach all the way to the controller. So I had to wire in these, uh, actually it's just an extension cord. I used both both uh, pieces of the extension cord for each of these to give it enough thickness to for the wiring because I thought the uh, wiring was going to be kind of critical. They're not heating up at all after drying it. 
but I made a couple of design decisions. One of them was that uh, I didn't like the, uh, I was not happy with the quality of these brakes. The brake, you're supposed to use their brakes because it has the uh, line that goes to the controller to tell it that you're braking so don't initiate the pedal assist or, or throttle or anything else. And uh, so I didn't, I don't know, they seem kind of flimsy. I did a test on the uh, ends of it and found out that it's 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 always off, so it doesn't matter whether I have them plugged in or not. But I'm no I'm not an idiot. I I'd still need a cutoff, so I mounted this one here. Uh, it doesn't go anywhere, but it does cut off, and that's one of the three leads that comes out here and goes along the top bar to the controller. So we got the interface. The PS selector, five levels up down, and the cutoff. Cutoff's very important. I mean, there's lots of times when there's a delay when you quit pedaling when the PAS disengages, and so you really need a cutoff. The other thing was I wanted this interface right here, up here on the top bar. Now, it came with these grommets that were made for the smallest part of the handlebar and did not work so I had to just cut some inner tube up and wrap it around there and tighten it up so uh, to get the thing working you just flip the switch on push the center button and the controller comes alive Alright, uh, so that's really the basics, I think, of it. Um, I'll probably think of other things I've left out, but uh, it is just so much fun. Of course, I've got these high powered lights, this little light here to. To shine on incoming traffic and uh, of course one back here I immediately needed uh, more luggage space so I put on this little $21 rack onto the back of it along with this really bright light all right safety first right so anyhow that's it oh one other thing uh, I might as well tell you, do not uh, put zip ties on this cable that's going to your hub. <laughs> Believe me, you'll, you'll uh, end up cutting those off a bunch of times because every time you have to take the hub off, this has to, you have to take the zip ties, cut them, and disconnect this thing from way up here on this connector. I don't know how I'm going to get all this make it to make it to look make it look really nice. If I shorten these wires, I can put a little thing underneath the bar maybe to run them through. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff to do, but it's uh, for right now it is working great and I'm having a blast. So that's it for now. Uh, I'm going to try to do a, another video that uh, tells you all about riding it and going through all the uh, parameters on this uh, controller that's uh, through the interface here. So, uh, till the next video, have fun, I'm off.